what I will cover is now under the title, A Trinity of Trouble. We just had a Supreme Court decision that decimated the Establishment Clause in the same way that uh, the peyote case in 1990 virtually nullified the Free Exercise Clause. So we're going to spend some time looking at just how far America has come in fulfilling Ellen White's observation that we would repudiate every principle of our Constitution as a Protestant and Republican government. Um, there are indeed prophetic developments. My sermon uh, this afternoon, and you know, the Lord has put this on my heart. I've been preaching on this topic now for, for more than a year, and you know, I do change topics from time to time, but the Lord won't let me let go of this one. And so he gives me enough uh, new insight and new approaches to, to hopefully keep it fresh, at least fresh enough that I don't get bored or, or worn out preaching it. Uh, but it's under the title, Overcoming Religious Intolerance. Um, now, in light of the emphasis of this weekend on the cross, I was inspired to, to do a few things here in, in beginning by connecting religious freedom uh, to the gospel. And so I thought, where better to start than in the gospels themselves? Now, there's, I have a lot of favorite religious liberty texts, and you're going to see uh, several of them uh, today. Um, what about the most famous text that, you know, the most illiterate Christians know this text, right? You know, the most biblically illiterate, they know John 3.16, or even if they can't recite it, they can tell you, oh, John 3.16, right? Well, this text does not support Calvinism, does it? It does not support predestination. It does not support the notion that we have no freedom to either respond to the grace of God, accept the gift of salvation, or turn our backs. Um, it suggests that we have an opportunity to say thank you for the gracious gift that Christ offers to us, that he has secured for us. Is that right? Whoever. Now, what does that word mean? How, who is included in whoever? And I want to think, you know, I'm going to challenge us today to think about the people that we're not sure we want as our neighbors in heaven. But they're included in whoever, aren't they? Whoever believes in Christ, has, there is no need for them to perish. They can have everlasting life. What did Jesus say to the Samaritan woman? John chapter 4. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but <clears throat> whoever drinks of the water that I shall give will never thirst. Jesus gives living water, the source of life itself. The water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, spring up into everlasting life. And that is available to whoever, anybody who wants to, may drink of the water. And what about a um, short time later, Jesus speaking to the crowd in Capernaum. Uh, he says, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And this is the will of him who sent me. It's interesting. This is the will of God. That some people who see the Son and believe may have everlasting life. That's not what it says. You know what Calvinism teaches, right? So an awful lot of Americans are of the view that God has already determined that you guys, you've been born to burn like the chaff, right? You're predestined to eternal damnation. You guys, you're the elect. You're the chosen, right? Nobody's clapping, you know? And it doesn't really matter what you do. You can't lose it, right? Because it's not up to you. It's up to God. He's already chosen you. Um, 
I'm going to give you a little bit of an aside here, but I've been thinking about this issue of Christ paying the penalty for our sins. And the absurd belief, the illogical belief that so many Christians have that on the one hand, Christ paid the penalty for our sins, but on the other hand, that the penalty for our sins is to burn forever and ever. Because nobody believes that Christ is burning. Do they? So if Christ isn't burning, then how could he pay the penalty for our sins? It doesn't make any sense to me. Now, I've asked a few people who believe that, and I haven't gotten a coherent response yet. I, I try to do it gently. Is religious liberty part of the three angels' messages? Now, I'm not going to quote a lot of, uh, I'm not going to quote any of A.T. Jones, but I will tell you that in his seminal sermons in 1893 and 95 General Conference sessions, he's on the subject of the third angel's message, he spent the first ten sermons on religious liberty. So what's the connection? Is there a connection? Are we missing something? You know, we as Adventists are fond of saying that the health message is the right arm. I don't see religious liberty as an appendage to the gospel. Christ paid the highest price for our freedom. Religious liberty is the gospel, is it not? You know, when my daughter, my daughter just graduated with her graphic design degree, um, you would make a father happy to send up a prayer for her job search activities um, because she's still being supported by dear old dad at the moment. Um, but when she was 10, I had her do an illustration for me for a brochure for my radio show for Freedom's Ring. Um, and the brochure picture that I had her do was a picture of the tree in the garden covered with bright red fruit, beautiful tree, green leaves, red fruit, and there was a fence, a barbed wire fence around it, and there was a sign with the universal knot symbol, you know, the red circle with the line through it, and the sign said, do not eat. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Well, nothing wrong with the picture of the tree. I guess we don't really know what color the fruit was, if it was red fruit or something else. There was no barbed wire fence. There was no sign, was there? Adam and Eve were free to eat or not eat. And the tree itself was guarded by none other than the word of God, right? God had, had made it very clear to them that they were not to eat, that it was a dangerous place. Now, if you think about it, you may have traveled to some dangerous places in your life. I try to stay out of them myself. My son just got back from eight months abroad, including through some pretty sketchy places in Southeast Asia. Um, and I'm thankful that he's back in one piece. The most dangerous place that has ever existed on planet Earth was that tree. Right? We know how to guard against dangerous places. We put guardrails on windy mountain roads. Um, I was out in Hawaii, a very popular snorkeling spot. There was a sign, there was a very smooth day, but there was a sign warning about the surf, even though the surf was pretty tame. Well, God knows how to warn. He knows how to protect. If you look in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, who was sent to guard the tree? It says cherubim. Now, cherubim is plural. So I don't know if they had minimum wage and overtime laws back then. You know, how many angels it took to guard the tree 
uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't know if they did, you know, six-hour shifts if they were on the European plan, only working, you know, four days a week or, you know, 30, 35 hours a week or, or how many hours they were working. But God knew how to have angels with flaming swords to make sure Adam and Eve didn't eat after they were expelled from the garden. Why did Christ choose to die rather than compromise our freedom? It's a very simple premise. Ellen White writes about it over and over again. Desire of Ages, she says, love cannot be commanded or coerced. Right? Only by love is love awakened. And we Adventists kind of take it for granted that, that we know this. That freedom is central to the gospel. But a lot of the Christian world is confused about this. Religious freedom really is central to the gospel, and I suggest to you that Jones had it right, it is central to the three angels' messages. The very first message, we've called it the last message of mercy to a dying world, is a call to return to the worship of the Creator. People have a choice in the matter. They'll have a choice between receiving the seal of God or the mark of the beast. To fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. It's a very simple, it's a very compelling message. But there's an element of choice in there, isn't there? Nobody is being, nobody's arms being twisted to worship God. Nobody's ever forced to worship. Now the second angel's message uh, this morning, someone asked about, um, you know, if, if somebody asked us, what about these three angels' messages, wh what would we say? I've, I've tried that trick in asking churches over the years about the second angel's message, and by and large, frankly, Adventists don't have any idea what the second angel's message is. I trust that this group may be better educated, better informed, but... Um, I'm going to take the liberty of unpacking this for us for a moment. Because I'm not sure that we have given careful thought to what we say is the very mission and message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Right? We, we claim that giving the world these three messages is why we exist. Is that right? But do we even wrestle with the text and think about the meaning of the text? Now, Babylon, we understand to be a corrupt religious power, right? And, her, and she has fallen. It's repeated twice. And um, I'm not going to uh, go into some of the issues as to uh, in what way she may have fallen. But it, it clearly indicates that her fall has something to do with her relationship to the state. Because it says, Babylon has fallen for, for is a word of explanation, for, because she has made all nations do something. So she is in close collaboration with the nations of the world, church and state working together. That's the first thing we see, right? Good, I see some heads nodding. <clears throat> what does she make these nations do? Well, the first thing is, if she's making the nations, she's the one calling the shots. The religious power is imposing her will upon the state. Well, that implies uh, that the laws are being conformed to the will of the church. She imposes her will upon the state. Well, that's what's meant by drinking the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, <clears throat> wine in the Bible is a symbol of doctrine or teaching. Uh, Jesus said famously not to put new wine into old wineskins, referring to the gospel. <clears throat> Babylon has made all nations drink of the wine, her wine. Now what is the wrath of her fornication? Well, first of all, the fornication, that's a very clear term. Um, I don't think it requires explanation, but it describes an immoral, intimate relationship between, in this case, who? 
church and state. A union of church and state. And where does the wrath come in? The wrath is very simply the power of the state to enforce the law, which reflects the doctrine of the church. Does that make sense? So out of this union of church and state comes the enforcement of the religious teachings of the church, the religious values and doctrines of the church. Um, we had a vigorous discussion at lunch about laws that protect uh, uh, discrimination laws on the basis of uh, homosexuality, which reflect, depending upon your viewpoint, either morality or immorality. Um, to have the church impose her teachings about the morality of homosexuality and return to an era when homosexuality or homosexual conduct was illegal, that would be the kind of thing that this verse is talking about, even though we would agree with the notion that homosexual conduct is immoral. Okay? You, you, you see, I hope I'm being clear with my distinctions here. The enforcement of doctrine of the church's teaching. This, the wine, this does not distinguish whether the doctrine is true or false, right? Now, we Adventists, we always think in terms of Sunday laws, and we think in terms of the enforcement of false religious law. But true religious law or true you know, moral law could be enforced as well and constitute a union of church and state. It can be either way. The point is that you know, clearly here, Babylon is suffering a moral collapse out of this relationship between church and state and out of uh, pursuing the power of the state. And from a spiritual point of view, I would point out that when the church pursues the power of the state, it is inevitably a substitute for the power of God. The church, our call is to rely fully and completely on the power of of the Holy Spirit. The power of the state is a substitute, and when we pursue that power, it's a pretty good sign that we are losing our grip on God. Now, the third message, of course, very simply talks about the consequences of our free choice. What happens if we choose to receive the mark if we choose to worship the beast. So religious freedom is through and through the three angels' messages. Do you see that? Now the good news, of course, is that we are free to make up our own minds, whether to accept the love of Christ and the gift of his salvation or not. We have that freedom. Um, I like to tell people in church, if you don't want to go to heaven, don't sweat it. You don't have to. Nobody, Jesus is not going to drag you kicking and screaming into the kingdom. You know, my kids are now big enough to pick me up and carry me kicking and screaming and put me in my room. But when they were little, on occasion, I had to pick up one or more of them. And uh, maybe you've had that same experience. But Jesus doesn't treat us that way, does he? So we don't have to go to heaven if we don't want to. You know, we really do have freedom. And that's good news. But there's also bad news. Because most of the world is not free to make up their own mind. Most of the world is not free to change their religion or to worship differently than the majority. Now, um, these numbers keep getting worse. Uh, I just saw for the first time from a reliable source that we're up to 
As recently as a few weeks ago, I was still using the 76% figure, and when I first started using these stats a couple of years ago, we were at 70%. And I'm going to give you a couple of slides in a minute from the Pew Research Center so you can kind of uh, get the map and, and see uh, the global picture a little bit. But, for example, in Nigeria, uh, you've heard of Boko Haram, in addition to uh, raiding Christian villages and, and killing everyone, they've been destroying churches. More than a thousand churches have been destroyed um, in, in recent years. Uh, a colleague who spoke at our NARLA summit a few weeks ago in Washington, D.C., told the story. NARLA, of course, is, uh, forgive me for, for speaking in acronyms, is the North American Religious Liberty Association, the precursor of which the international, or uh, well, the International Religious Liberty Association goes back to 1893, um, and certainly A. T. Jones was instrumental in, in founding that, and its precursor, the American Religious Liberty Association. The Adventist Church is well known internationally for our work on religious freedom, and if you're anywhere near Florida at the end of August, our uh, what is it called? Um, Eighth World Congress is going to be in Hollywood, Florida, um, the last week of August <coughs> of the International Religious Liberty Association. So that brings diplomats, government officials, faith leaders, um, folks from NGOs, you know, experts in religious freedom together for uh, several days for um, a really nice, uh, very important uh, gathering. So one of our colleagues at the recent NARLA summit told about going into Nigeria to document the stories of those who have suffered um, persecution by Boko Haram. And um, they were pursued by Boko Haram when they went in there because it's still very dangerous in, in parts of, of Nigeria. And one of the stories that she told was of a woman who had fled when the soldiers came to, when the terrorists came to destroy the village, killed her husband. She and her two children uh, fled. They escaped into the mountains. They survived for many, many weeks, eating berries, eating grass, drinking urine. It was just horrific. And finally were able to return to their village and try to rebuild their lives. So the colleague who was telling the story reports that she asked this woman, what message would you like me to bring back to folks in America? Is there something that, that you think they should hear out of your, and learn out of your experience? And what she said was, tell them, um, I'm praying for you because they're coming for you next. She's praying for us. Whew. Have you seen some of these pictures? You've heard about it. I don't know if you care to look on the web. Um, I haven't looked to see if they've posted the after pictures. I call this the before. Um, we thought that the world had become more civilized, but apparently it hasn't. Uh, but, you know, the thing that disturbs me the most in this picture is not what's in the foreground, friends, but do you see what's in the background? This is uh, age-appropriate, this is how you want to raise your children and have young... I mean, these kids can't be more than six years old, right? Six, eight years old, these boys standing back there. They're just... Words fail me when I see a picture like this. Um, of course, Christians have been beheaded, but it's not just... it. Yes, there's an awful lot of Christian persecution, but it's not just Christians. According to the State Department, Christians face persecution in more than 60 countries because of their belief in Christ. 
but it's also Muslims or those who differ from the prevailing Muslim ideology. So Yazidis are not regarded as, they're regarded as idolaters by um, the Shia. And here there are some Yazidis rounded up uh, and being uh, shot and uh, at the edge of, of a pit that was dug for their bodies. This is in, uh, in northern Iraq. Um, in Burma, my son who was traveling went to Burma, but of course uh, they didn't allow him anywhere near the country where the, uh, where the Muslims are <coughs> and where the government, even though there have been some very helpful changes in the government there, um, they are still uh, tolerating the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya Muslim community there in Burma. <coughs> of course, Jews have been ethnically cleansed from most of the Middle East. Um, there is no longer a Jewish community in Iraq, although there was before um, the American invasion. Um, when uh, I had dinner with my son recently, he said that there were two countries that he could not go in Southeast Asia. He could not go to Malaysia or Indonesia because he was Jewish, uh, and they don't allow Jews there. So let's take a look at these Pew Research Center um, maps. And the first one is going to show government and legal restrictions on religious freedom. The second one are social restrictions. So you see the countries in red are the places that have the harshest legal restrictions. You may be aware that uh, Russia has banned um, put in, a, in place a very restrictive law regarding religions and have cracked down first on the Jehovah Witnesses. And they have confiscated properties and imprisoned pastors, etc., and outlawed their meetings. The Adventist Church has had legal status in Russia for a number of years, so you know we continue to enjoy at least the freedom to worship, although it is still illegal to evangelize um, in Russia. But you can see why a third, you know, how quickly we get to a third of the world's population, or I should say 70 or 80 percent of the world's population living in countries with little or no religious freedom when, you know, you start by including China and India, which together constitute more than a third of the population. And I would note from this slide that um, the legal restrictions on religious freedom are considered moderate in the United States, but not low. Now, what about social hostilities? Now, this is where India, um, it was high in terms of legal restrictions, but it's very high in terms of the hostility from the Hindu majority to Christians and other minorities. James Standish, when he was at the General Conference in Religious Liberty, he took a trip over to India because he'd heard about the plight of an Adventist pastor who had been hacked to death and left in the town square literally in pieces. And he thought it appropriate for the Adventist church to offer some uh, solace, some comfort, some aid for the church there and let them know they were not alone. Well, before he got to the village, which was very remote, um, he went to visit folks at the embassy and asked about conditions in that part of the country, and they said they didn't know very much. And he asked them why, and they said, well, because it's not safe to travel there, but since you're going, when you come back, would you tell us, you know, give us a report? So it was okay for James and other church officials from India to go where they were unwilling to go themselves. So James uh, and officials from the church in India, they get up to this remote village and they're there on Sabbath and they uh, worship with a small group under a tree. And after the worship service, they're talking with the head elder there and inquiring you know, about how things are going and, and what they can do to help. You know, we came all the way from the general conference and we're very concerned. Is there anything we can do to help you? 
the head elder looks at him and he says, we have God. We don't need anything. They had nothing, but they didn't need anything. And, you know, James told this, I've heard him tell this story a number of times over the years. He told it for a sermon when I was back in D.C. recently. And I was, I was reminded how here in the United States, you know, we have everything. Uh, but what we really need is God. Isn't that right? And I wonder sometimes if the everything that we have doesn't crowd out God in our lives. Well, you start to add the high. You see we add Brazil here and, and Mexico with high social hostilities and uh, a much larger portion of Africa. And um, you can see how we get to 79% of the global population. I suspect that this map would be revised. This is a couple years old. There'd be perhaps a little more red and a little more of that uh, tan brown to show um, the persecution. So you know, I'm going to skip this slide and keep going. The question that remains for us with, with so many being persecuted, does God see? Does God care? Well, we know the answer to that question, and the scripture I've given here is taken from the Exodus when the Jews were suffering under harsh slave conditions in Egypt, and they were crying out, and God said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And you know what that biblical term means, don't you? God is intimately acquainted with the sufferings of his people. And he has come down to deliver them. The question is not phrased correctly. We know that God sees. We know that God cares. The question is, do we? Right? Do we care about how people of faith, whether it's our own faith or other faiths, are being persecuted and killed because they're the wrong religion all over the world? But you know, here in America we have uh, a different problem. Uh, it's oftentimes Christians who um, <clears throat> are perceived as the intolerant ones by those who are liberal and those who are secular. Now, I put this slide up not to defend the secular liberal perspective, but if we as Christians with a mission to preach the gospel and to share the gospel, if we don't understand our own culture and what we're up against, we can't succeed. You know, now, in our discussion, it was clear that there are some uh, among us and many Christians don't believe that homosexuality is innate. They believe it is, you know, it's conduct, it's a choice. I'm not interested in weighing in to that debate. My point here is that there are many um, who are quite convinced that it is just as innate as skin color. And so from that point of view, the idea of praying away the gay is just makes just as much sense as for me to say to you, sister, I'm going to pray away your black skin color. I mean, you know, at, at a minimum, if I were to say that to you, you would say, has this guy lost his mind? You know, you might be offended, you might be angry or upset, or you might just say, this guy is just too absurd and ridiculous to even bother being angry with. But you're certainly not going to make, uh, lay the groundwork for any kind of further dialogue or relationship. But this is how the church is perceived, as, you know, just um, unalterably hostile and intolerant of people who are different. Um, the 
president of the Southern Baptist Convention when I was in law school, was infamously quoted at the convention of preaching that God doesn't hear the prayer of a Jew. Well, I'm Jewish. God's listening to my prayers, I hope. I think that's completely ridiculous. God hears everybody's prayers. Of course he does. But, you know, this begins to sow seeds of how it is. You wonder, why is it that these folks, you know, why do they think we're so intolerant? We don't generally, most, I have yet to meet a Christian who said, who, I really believe I'm intolerant, I'm homophobic, I'm intolerant of gays, I'm intolerant of, I'm racist, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, maybe you've met somebody who identifies as genuinely intolerant. Uh, I have not. We don't see ourselves that way, but others see us that way. And why is it? Well, there's a flood of legislation introduced in various red states that would restrict not just abortion, but access to uh, various health benefits for women, uh, including reproductive health. They're seen as sexist, hostile to women's health, and, and, and sponsored by the religious right. And so the church is associated with, and Christ by extension is associated with, hatred, hostility, uh, intolerance, etc. And this is the cultural climate in which we get to share the three angels' messages. And, you know, how do we distinguish ourselves? How do we overcome the perception of intolerance? Well, now I'm going to turn the tables because I think that the first thing that we need to do is take a look at our own attitudes and examine our own hearts. We know that there are those many in our culture who are intolerant of us, who are hostile to us. But what is our attitude towards them? Are we hostile to them? Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, in this sermon, distills the wisdom and teaching of the Hebrew Scriptures in one concise, consolidated sermon. If you've never done the study tracing every concept in the Sermon on the Mount to the Hebrew Scriptures, you've missed out. It's worth the time and effort. You can trace all of this and this one to Leviticus 19. You've heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even the pagans do that. So be perfect, he says, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. When I came into the Adventist church, there were those who wanted me to believe that perfection was measured by not eating chocolate chip cookies and being vegan, etc., and I have been vegan, and happily so at various times in my life. I have nothing against it, but I don't really see it as the ultimate moral issue. Jesus insists that uh, how we relate to our enemies is a primary moral issue. Isn't that right? We're called to love our enemies. Anybody... Anybody here actually have had any enemies? Any people that you just like, ugh, that person has been out to destroy me. They're my enemy. Am I the only? I see one couple of hands. Okay, so, um, you know, afterwards you tell me if you, um, if you think I'm wrong about this, but I've come to the conclusion that it is not humanly possible to love our enemies. 
that Christ is asking us to do what he knows very well we are not capable in our own strength of doing, right? But he did it, didn't he? If when we were, what were we? We were his enemies. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Jesus died for us, not because we were so buddy-buddy, because we were his friends. He died for us even when we were enemies. He gave his life for us. That is the love of Christ, and that is the love that can be lodged squarely in our hearts, that can uh, motivate us day by day. Isn't that right? So we may not be able to love our enemies, but we can seek the love of Christ in our hearts. And that can change even how we feel about people and how we treat them, right? Even people who hold ideas and beliefs and values that we find abhorrent, that we think are terribly ungodly, we can still love them. They, Jesus still died for them, didn't he? Well, there were some Jews who actually didn't pay full attention to Leviticus 19, um, and they wondered about whether uh, how, how far this idea of loving your neighbor should go. And, of course, the one who brought it up with Jesus was none other than a lawyer which may explain why I love to tell this story. Um, it was a lawyer who stood up to put Jesus to the test. And he says, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And this is how we know that Jesus was Jewish. As the old joke goes, the priest says to the rabbi, Why is it you Jews always answer a question with a question? And the rabbi says, So why not? So here Jesus answers a question not with one, but with two questions. What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer gives the right answer, gets an A. He quotes from Deuteronomy 6, the central text of every uh, synagogue service, every Shabbat morning service uh, from what has become known as the Shema, um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, uh, all your strength. And then he adds Leviticus 19, and your neighbor is yourself. And Jesus says, great answer. You're on the right track. Just go and do this. Now, in law school, they teach us lawyers, be careful not to ask too many questions, or ask the question that you don't know the answer to. That's where this lawyer got into trouble. If he just left it alone right here, he was fine, right? But he had to, he had to push. Luke discerned a bad attitude on the part of the lawyer. He asks, who is my neighbor? He's thinking, well, my fellow Jew, that's my neighbor, but, you know, he's, uh, he's not prepared to extend the concept of neighbor. And I wonder how far we're prepared to extend the concept of neighbor. Now, in this story, there's two things that um, you may not have considered, because I know you've all heard the story so many times, I'm not going to tell you the story um, at great length. The first is, if, if you consider the cultural context of first century uh, Palestine or Israel. Jesus, who are the number one enemies that the Jewish leaders are concerned about at that time? It's the Romans and the Roman soldiers that are all around them. Jesus does not tell the story that it's a Roman soldier who helps the poor Jew who's been beaten up by the robbers and left for dead at the side of the road. That would be really offensive to the Jews, to have the person helping uh, the, the one who is regarded as the neighbor be a Roman. Jesus actually ups the ante 
and goes beyond the unthinkable to the totally absurd by saying it was a Samaritan. Why? Because the Samaritans were hated even more than the Romans. The Samaritans were a little too close for comfort because they themselves were actually descendants of the tribes of Israel. They were Jews who were not taken into captivity. They were left behind, as it were. Um, they had a different form of Judaism that they felt was the right form, and the hostility was so uh, uh, hot between them that if this weren't a made-up story, but real life, the Samaritan would have stooped over the, the poor wounded Jew and finding that he was still breathing, slashed his throat and made sure that the job was finished. That's how the Jews and Samaritans regarded themselves. So if Jesus says that the Samaritan and the lawyer had to agree with him at the end of the parable, the way that the enemy treated the Jew, that's included in being a neighbor. You know, who is our neighbor? I've got to breeze through these slides here, but these are women um, working in a sweatshop in Southeast Asia. I dare say some of us today, because there's enough people here, we're wearing clothes made by slaves, made by children, under slave-like conditions in Southeast Asia. And we're wearing them right now, right here. And if we really knew uh, what we were wearing, we'd probably prefer to take them off, even at the risk of embarrassment. Who is my neighbor? Um, there's a lot of talk in our country today about Muslims and immigration. Are these people our neighbor? Um, you know, I've got to say here, one of, you know, Church State Council, we become the foremost legal services organization uh, in the West uh, dealing with religious discrimination cases, and, and we represent people of all faiths. And lately, we've been asked to take on some cases for Muslims, and we're working with one of the Muslim organizations. And there's a young lawyer there who is um, American-born uh, Palestinian. And I said to him, after we got acquainted, I said, Saad, you and I, we're the hope of the world. You're a, you're a Palestinian Muslim, and he's practicing Muslim. I said, I'm a Jew who believes in Jesus. If you and I can be friends, there's hope for the world. Right? Now, I interviewed him on the radio one time, and I asked him the $64,000 question. How do, you, how do you answer those who you know, wonder whether Islam really is a religion of peace? You know, and it's certainly, with all that's gone on, it's a fair question. And I don't think that it gets addressed um, you know, as often as it should. And I love the answer that he gave me. He said, look, I was raised going to mosque, hearing sermons every week, and all I heard growing up my entire life is about peace. Um, and I never heard anything else but, uh, you know, being respectful and courteous to, to people of all faiths and, and, you know, being living in peace with everybody. That's how I've been taught. Um, I thought that was a great answer. You know, there's the theological, well, what do the scholars say the texts mean and all of that? And then there's, you know, the experiential. Um, who is my neighbor? Are the folks picking the crops and cleaning our hotel rooms and cooking our food and washing the dishes in the restaurants and what have you? Are these folks our neighbor? By the way, <coughs> um, the Adventist churches in the West, about a third of those in attendance are undocumented. And when Arizona cracked down on immigration a couple of years ago, the Arizona conference lost uh, probably more than a thousand folks that fled, many of them to uh, north to Nevada. There were some new Spanish-speaking churches started in Nevada after the Arizona crackdown. Um, these folks are not strangers. They are part of our church. And whatever we think our government policy should be as Christians. You know, I'm not talking politics here today, folks. Not at all. And I won't in the seminar either. Um, we keep politics out of the pulpit. And that's very important that we do that, isn't it? That we not be... We all have strong political opinions. Well, some of us do. 
you know, I'll admit I have strong political opinions. I've encountered some in talks with friends here, and that's fine. We're, you know, we're entitled to that, and we're entitled to differ even. Our unity is in Christ, and we can't allow, you know, our political or social views to divide us. This is someone, a uh, little refugee child. Um, here's a picture of a gay pride parade. Are gays, are they our neighbor? Are we called to treat them with kindness and respect? And last time I preached a sermon, somebody said to me, he was a bus driver in, in, in Orange County, he said, what about the homeless? You know, he, has, he encounters a lot of homeless people. Are they our neighbor? How do we deal with, you know, caring for the homeless? Now, <clears throat> this is actually my number one favorite religious liberty text. And the reason why is because Jesus is pictured as a gentleman. He is standing at the door of our hearts, graciously, patiently, persistently knocking, asking us to please open up our hearts. But he is not banging the door down. He, doesn't, he won't come in if you don't want him. He's a gentleman. He's not like a man who forces himself on a lady, right? He's a gentleman. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of his writings I read last year, where he asked, Who is this Jesus knocking? And he answered, with the parable that Jesus told of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. We're running short on time. I'm not going to read it for you. You know how it goes. Inasmuch as I've, you've done it to the least of one of these, Jesus said, you've done it to me. Right? I was in the middle of preaching this a few months ago. And sometimes when I'm preaching, you know, Surprising things happen. I get these ideas. I say these things I didn't expect to say. And I thought, of, I'm, I'm saying the least of these, and I, I had the realization, Jesus doesn't regard anybody as the least, does he? He doesn't demean anybody. He doesn't put anybody down. When he says, in as much as you've done it to the least of one of these, he's reading our hearts. We're the ones who think we're better than somebody else. And the fact is, you know, we all have different backgrounds, and um, our attitudes are going to be different, but we all, there are some people that we kind of sneer at, or we, you know, we're disgusted by, or we just don't like, or, you know, we judge them because of their appearance, or, you know, some characteristic or something. I dare say there are liberals who hate Trump supporters. And there are conservatives who hate Bernie Sanders supporters or Hillary Clinton supporters, right? Uh, on the basis of political views, on the basis of race, or maybe it's how they're dressed. People with tattoos. Some people don't like people with tattoos or with colored hair or facial piercings or... You know, there's a whole lot of ways that we look at people and we regard them as beneath us. And Jesus said, if you want to be the sheep, if you want to be on the right side of the judgment, that depends on your attitude and your conduct to those that you are most likely to write off. The ones that you would rather dispose of. You regard them as beneath you. And you have to learn to see them as Jesus. To see Jesus in them and to treat them as you would treat Jesus. Whether it's to give a cup of cold water, to clothe, to feed, to care for, as if they were Jesus. This is the core teaching of the judgment. 
And, you know, the third angel's message is a judgment hour message. But this really cuts very close to the heart, doesn't it? Well, who after all is the least? Jesus claims that status for himself, doesn't he? This evening, I think the presentation is on Christ in the Psalms. Well, here's Christ in the Psalms in Psalm 22. This is one of the scriptures that uh, was read to me before I was a believer to show me Christ in the Hebrew scriptures. It's Jesus who says, I am a worm and no man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads, saying he committed his cause to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Prophecy of his experience on the cross as he literally became a worm and no man, or figuratively, I guess. Jesus says, I am the least. So there is no one that properly should be, that we should properly regard as the least, right, as beneath us. So it struck me that others won't see Jesus in us if we don't see Jesus in them. In this culture war context, in this, in this seminar, I'm going to talk about where we Adventists really fit in between the secular left and the religious right in this culture war context. But in a context that makes it so hard to, to actually present the claims of the gospel to people, it's so critical that people don't identify us with the intolerant right and that they can see Jesus in us. And I suggest to you that the key to them seeing Jesus in us is how we see them. And if we see Jesus in them and we treat them as we would Jesus, that's going to make a huge impact. That's going to open the heart to the claims of the gospel. And very simply, that's the ba- that's our that's what Jesus says is how we're judged. Now, part of the emphasis, and and this is where we'll wrap up here. Um, How are we doing? We're probably over time, but not too, too bad. Uh, We'll still have some time for questions. But our emphasis in the Pacific Union has been to try to promote uh, some panel discussions, invite people, leaders of other faiths, for Know Your Neighbor programs, because we want our churches to connect with other faith communities, and get to know their struggles, their concerns. Um, It's often been said, how do you destroy your enemy? You make them your friend. Um, I'll close with this thought. If we as Adventists believe prophetically that we will be on the receiving end of persecution someday, and that that someday might even be soon. It behooves us not to do the work of the enemy in becoming the other. What do I mean by that? Nobody persecutes their own kind, right? They don't persecute their own us. We don't persecute us, we persecute them. Adventists for too long have had an us and them mentality. We have the truth, we have the message, and they need what we have. And besides, they're against us because they have Sunday and we have Sabbath. And we have used our beliefs to create barriers. And we have separated ourselves. And so we're doing the work of the enemy for him because, you know, before you can persecute someone, you have to first create that separation. They can't be part of us. They have to be them. The way to overcome that is to embrace those who are them and make them part of us.